Imagine a pleasant conversation with a middle-aged woman in her kitchen. She is stout with deep umber skin. She is sitting on a worn out sofa as the fine aroma of what she's cooking travels through the room. There is about her an easy informality as she speaks about the simple details of her life day to day. Her speech still has the soft cadence of the South, where she once dreamed of living in a new house in a large and prosperous northern city. Half that dream has come true. She lives in Chicago, but her home is in Robert Taylor, a place known for robbing people of their dreams. She lives in a cluttered three-bedroom apartment with nine people, but in a larger sense, she is alone. Most of her neighbors are gone. Her building, now half empty, is the last in what was once the largest federal housing project in the world. Not long ago, the woman could look out of her barred 12th floor window and see two other buildings, twin 16-story structures that stood just to the left and right of her own. The towering triplets formed a U-shaped quadrant with a courtyard in the center. Now, there is no courtyard, only a block-long vacant field with feeble grass and blowing trash. A single police car stands sentry. The woman says the police patrol does little to stem the drug trade that still thrives in the musty stairwells. Her attitude about the drug use is one of acceptance. It is a temporary salve for misery. What she does not accept is the absence of her neighbors. She says she misses them. Since they have left, it's been too quiet. We used to being able to see a lot of people. We used to being able to communicate with one another. At Robert Taylor, Noah's was a companion. Within each of the quadrants that once lined South State Street lived thousands of people. Most of them were children. The woman says that in her building, she knew most of the kids who had long ago abandoned the dilapidated play lots and preferred playing in the buildings themselves, chasing each other along the porches, up and down the grimy stairwells and in and out of the dim elevators. They transformed the buildings into their personal jungle gyms. Their voices were integral to Robert Taylor, as much a part of it as the mortar that held it all together. And there were other voices, a sea of them, laughing, joking, coughing, cursing. They all mingled with slamming doors and pounding feet along the cement porches, radios and stereos and TV sets from within the apartments, shouts, squeals, creaking swings and raucous basketball games from the courtyard. Most of that has been silenced now. But the woman on the 12th floor says she longs to hear it all again, that symphony of familiar sounds and voices. There was a rhythm to it, understood by someone who hears it day to day. Taylor was a community of known names and faces. Though most are gone now, they have left behind their imprint. Letters on walls made with heavy markers or spray paint spell names, assert phrases, announce couples, warn enemies. Tweety, Tasha, Tootie, and Honeyback. They are sprayed along cinder block walls stained with old paint and grit. Carlissa, Dog Pound, Dana, and Friends. They tell of proud couplings and hope for unions for Nita and Anthony, Rose and Eddie, Shantae and Pete. Crude slogans sprawl over the frail, failing elevators with doors that wheeze shut. Love in the Boogie Ward. Inside Villain City, we have it all. Rank assertions line the walls of dark stairwells that reek piercingly of piss. Too hot, too touch. Pimpin' and hoein' is the thing. The gorilla bitch lives here. Sworn allegiances and threats to enemies shout from the breezeway. Forever gangster, GD's running this mother. 
Tributes and farewells to fallen friends and comrades speak with simple pathos from walls and doors. Rest in peace, Wayne. Rest in peace, Antonio. Rest in peace, Sean. No matter how many times the names, slogans, requests, demands, curses, and prayers are painted over, within days or hours, they reappear. We're still here. Clean this place. Where are you, God? Don't hate us all. Voices on a wall, across a door, down a stairwell, in a breezeway, through a corridor, speak with stark clarity. In a mildly rehabbed apartment on the seventh floor, a collage of faces covers an entire wall in an explosion of hues and expressions. They are smiling, scowling, and mugging for the camera of a man the other residents call the picture man. They are families, friends, relatives, couples, and neighbors, and most are remnants of the past. They are the faces of former residents who have dispersed to other neighborhoods. Nearly all who are left in the picture man's building have moved to the lower floors where there is fresh paint and new repairs. The light rehab, he says, is nothing more than a landlord's concession to the last remaining tenants, a calm before the storm of eviction. The picture man says he doesn't know where he will move. Taylor has always been his home. When he leaves, he will take the collage as a photographic record of all the people who lived in his building. Two flights below, on the fifth floor, a tall, rail-thin woman stands at her kitchen sink cleaning chickens. Her apartment is damp and too hot and a wash with the putrid smell of broken plumbing. The woman apologizes for the heat and the foul odor. She explains that she's had no more luck getting the sewer pipe repaired than she has her bathtub, which is missing its faucet and urinates a constant stream of hot water, or her toilet, which she must flush with a bucket, or her hissing radiators, which have left glistening streaks on her walls and mold running along her ceiling in coils of rot. She says she's glad to be leaving Taylor. Can't wait. Anything, any place, would be better than this rodent metropolis she has called home for eight years. Yet, she emphasizes, waiting for repairs is an exercise in frustration, an endless game of vacillation between can't do and can't get. The man sitting on the bed drinking a 40-ounce agrees. Worse than the wretched apartment, he says, is the environment. They worry about their oldest son, who at 14 is starting to drift away from school and away from their stern instruction. The woman asks how they can demand that their son do well in school or find a job when he can make $1,000 a day selling drugs. The woman says they talk to their son every day, begging him to do right. Within a year, they and all of their neighbors, the last tenants in the last building, in the most massive housing project ever undertaken, will receive their final notices of evacuation. A curt letter will state a specific end to their tenancy at Robert Taylor Homes. They will pack furniture, clothes, toys, posters, family Bibles, photo albums, items accumulated over years, generations. They will pile them into moving vans and old trucks and cars borrowed from friends and pull away from what is for many of them the only home they have ever known. A fortunate few will find a rent-assisted apartment in a better neighborhood. Fewer still will move into a unit in a new housing development. But most will have little more knowledge then than now of where they will go. They will be relocated to other housing projects, exchanging one hellhole for another. They will find transient motels and break up the family into several single rooms. They will crowd in with friends or relatives or they will end up on the street. The woman on the 12th floor knows what will happen. She's seen it before. First, there will be a gradual exodus that will accelerate as the final evacuation date nears, with four, five, six or more families moving on the same day until it seems as if an entire neighborhood is uprooting and clearing out all at once. They will leave behind a hollow behemoth that will stand cold, cadaverous, 
with only thin remembrances of the life that once breathed inside of it. Then a tall fence will sprout up and encircle it before wrecking balls and cranes move in to begin bashing in its walls and clawing out its floors and porches until they collapse in a shower of rock and dust. It will stand for a time with jagged walls and broken floors and ripped iron beams exposed like some eviscerated mammoth before it is pounded into rubble and then it will disappear. The woman says she stays up nights worrying about where her family will live. Buying a house is out of the question, and landlords are reluctant to rent to a family of ten people. Breaking up the family is unacceptable, and there are no relatives or friends with a home large enough to accommodate them all. There is always the prospect of relocating to still another housing project, but she so dearly hopes for something better. She spends a lot of time praying, down on her knees under a huge banner that declares, Jesus is real, asking for God's grace and guidance. She says that God will answer her prayers. She knows that he will lead her. For now, she will clean her cramped apartment and scold and diaper her many grandchildren. She will hunt down bargains at used furniture and clothing stores. She will clip supermarket coupons and improvise sumptuous meals. She will chat with friends and sit with her daughters to catch up on her favorite soaps. She will live day to day in a community with no future. Is it? 